So we're here out at Life University getting ready to do a lecture series um, out here in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, we were invited out by their College of Business and Entrepreneur Specialist to come and speak and drop some, some good knowledge on what it was that we did to start the process and how we've been able to continue to flourish. Oh, you want to
Chicago has a very, very rich culture from the standpoint that a lot of it is still a lot of old neighborhoods. So you have your Dominican neighborhoods, your Puerto Rican neighborhoods, you have your Polish neighborhoods. So I'm experiencing all these different um, neighborhoods, and then I'm also experiencing this, this culture called streetwear, which is very, very much so passion, very, very, it's very, um, it's very much a combination of street art um, and graffiti and, of course, the hip-hop community. So after, you know, going to all these parties, meeting all these different people, uh, I was sitting in my cousin's apartment, and I was like, you know, I really don't want to do this for the rest of my life. You know, and that was, I was talking about working with somebody or working at this radio station. You know, so I, I'm a Christian, and, you know, my partners are Christians, and, you know, so we, uh, I asked God, I said, okay, you know, what is it that I can do for the rest of my life without, you know, having to feel like I'm a slave with being able to enjoy what it is I'm doing, um, and also being able to provide a living for my family, because, I mean, at the end of the day, that's why we all work so hard, so we could eventually be able to reap some financial benefits. And it was pretty instant, you know, it felt like God started dropping these ideas in my head. One of the first ideas that we came up with um, was this concept called nine fives so for those afraid to fly. And that, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know this, but that was going to be the design and the concept that pretty much molded my whole company. Um, Repeat that. It says that nine fives. Nine fives for those afraid to fly. <laughs> and just for, just for the record, that statement isn't necessarily um, knocking anybody who does have a 9 5 job because, you know, my mom, she had a 9 5. Uh, a lot of people I know have a 9 5. But statistically, when you take a look at the people who are actually happy in their jobs, you know, most people hate them. You know, most people dread getting up and going to the morning. They, look, they wake up on Monday looking forward to Friday, and then come Sunday, they're like, man, I gotta get up and go back to work on Monday. And, for me, that's not a life that I want to live. Um, so that's pretty much what that statement represented. And just for the record, I don't want this to be a, I know this is a quote unquote lecture, but if anybody has any questions in the process of me talking, you know, touch the sky, let me know, um, and so we can engage in conversation. So it's not like a, a fish in a fish tank and that you guys are looking at me. But, um, so, so yeah, so we, we came up with, I came up with this idea, and at the time it was just myself. Um, and then what I did was I, I reached out to some, some street artists in Chicago and they started to help me do the actual design of the actual, of the actual design. So after I got that and a couple other designs that I sent it over to my partner, Darnell, and at the time we were just the best friends we weren't partners. And one thing about him is he has a reputation of being brutally honest. You know, so I knew that if I got the okay from him, you know, that the designs were, you know, look good, then I might have something on the table. You know, and one thing that you always wanted to keep in consideration, and this isn't just with being an entrepreneur, but also with, uh, well, also just with making any major decision, you always want to get an outside party's perspective, you know, because when you're doing something yourself, you're so invested in what that project is, or what that company is, you don't, you don't always see all, all perspectives, you know, so he was my, my third party perspective, so, you know, I sent it over to him and I said, hey, look, this is some things that I'm working on, let me know what you think. And, you know, to my pleasant surprise, he was like, yo, this, this design's are dope, they're great designs, you know, who's doing this? I was like, well, I'm doing it. He was like, oh, okay, cool. So, that, that, at that point, that's when he said, okay, you know, we might have something here, let's keep pushing forward with this. So now, we come to the bigger now, what are we going to call this company? What is this company going to represent? You take a look at any very successful company, there's an identity that's associated with it. Um, there's always there's something that you can, that your emotions are pulled on towards and says, okay, you know, I identify with this. You know, this is why I want to, you know, have this product, Starbucks. People don't buy Starbucks because the coffee or the tea is that good. They buy it because of the identity that's associated with it. They, when you have that Starbucks uh, mug or cup in your hand, you feel a certain way about your stuff. Why? Because that's what they project on TV. So what I did was I started just writing out a list of names of, of company, of, of names that I felt like they would represent this company well. Um, at the time, the company wasn't called Honor Roll. Um, the company was called Best of Glory. And I felt like I wanted to have this company represent my, me and my partner from the perspective of how we grew up, um, our, our level of ambition, our level of drive and determination. Uh, our sense of loyalty, our sense of, you know, going after this quote-unquote American dream of vengeance. And I thought it was a great idea. You know, at the time, he thought it was a great idea. So what we said was, okay, since, you know, we both think this is a good idea, let's present this, this name with some, to some other people 
kind of see if they get the exact same reaction that we're feeling. So after doing that, uh, we sent it out to about like 10 different people, and the, the results were pretty much that they thought that this was going to be kind of like a, a rocker brand and a lot of shiny stuff and skulls, and that's not what we represented. So although it was a good attempt, you know, what we felt wasn't getting conveyed to, to, to the consumers or to our potential consumers. So what we did was we went back to the drawing board, and that's when we kind of when we came up with the name Honor Roll. Now the name Honor Roll is it has, almost has a double entendre to it because when you think of it, and you know, obviously because you guys are in school, you know, you think of you know excellence, you know, maintaining the best grades, you had a high level of achievement, and you pretty much you know did your thing when it came to your academics. Um, the irony in that was that me and my partner had never been on the honor roll before, uh, throughout middle school or high school. Um, were you ever on it in elementary? Yeah, I used to get So, he was on it. I, I never quite met it. I always ended up getting C's or bad conduct, conduct or something like that. So, I was never on the honor roll. But, if you take a look at the same principles that you would need to obtain that honorable status in my school, again, working hard, being dedicated, being determined, being focused. You know, these are the exact same principles that you need to be successful in life. And I think that all of our professors over here can pretty much agree with that. Yeah? No? Okay, great. Amen. Amen. So, and then, so then we took that name and then we did another test run of it and we started asking, you know, some more people, you know, well, how do you guys feel about this name? And then that's when it clicked. It was like, okay, they were getting the same emotional tug that we were getting when we came up with this name. So we said, okay, um, we, have, we have a name, our own clothing group. So now at this point, this is now going into uh, my junior year in, in college. Uh, I pretty much took a, a year and a half time span where I did pretty much nothing but research on other companies that had came out that were similar to mine and the, the methods that they used to penetrate their markets. Excuse me. Um, as well as I took a lot of time to figure out, okay, I have this name, I have this one design. How do I want to continuously tell my story? How do I want to express myself through this brand? Um, and a lot of times what ends up happening is, which I think this is one of the biggest reasons why the, the, the statistic rate of businesses and new companies failing, you can't rush into anything. You know, everything has to be planned. I mean, you can't be scared at the same time, but you have to, you have to make calculated decisions. Making calculated decisions isn't the same as making extremely risky decisions or emotional decisions. Um, so we took about a year, year and a half to, to really plan out how it was we wanted to penetrate the um, market, how we wanted to present the brand, um, going through countless and countless of different designs to make sure that, okay, you know, when we release this product, it was going to come across the way we wanted it to. Um, so now, just kind of pausing right there, there's there's some steps that need to take place in order for us to become a legitimate business. Uh, one of the things that we had to do was become a, uh, we had to get incorporated, uh, which our local corporation was become an LLC, limited liability company. Do you guys know what that is or what that definition is? All right, I saw some head nods. I saw some heads just stay the same. So for those who did not, what that pretty much means is that I'm separating myself from my company. Um, if some, if I once we get very very uh, wealthy. If somebody ever wanted to come and sue my company, they could only attack the assets that my company had. They can't attack my own personal assets. Um, so it's it, it's almost like a very good safety precaution. Um, now, some other ways you could go is getting a regular incorporated corporation, um, or you could do a nonprofit corporation. And if you get a nonprofit corporation, uh, what pretty much happens at that point is that you can't can't show a profit at the end of the year, but you get a lot of amazing tax, um, tax cuts and tax write-offs, which is why like, you'll see a lot of times a lot of athletes or, or very, very wealthy people, they have these non-profit organizations to kind of um, write off a lot of stuff from their other personal businesses. So, um, so we got the LLC, and for us, it only cost us $125. I'm a personal fan of doing everything myself. You can go to companies like LegalZoom.com, but the only problem with that is you going to a third party. They like to, they'll tag on a whole bunch of other extra fees, and you'll end up spending like a thousand plus dollars on something that you could have did yourself for 125. So after we did that, we had to create ourselves a logo. Um, and with that logo, we have to get that logo trademark. A lot of people think that you copyright a logo, but that's not the case. You get a trademark. Now, the trademarking process actually takes about two years, and you're probably end up spending anywhere between six to eight hundred dollars on it. But the great thing about it is, 
once you start that trademarking process, as long as it's clear from the standpoint that nobody else has that logo or they have they don't have that logo in their database, you can use it for promotional or for tags or for whatever case you need. But there's another year and a half to where you have where it goes through a process of it being contested uh, by anybody uh, coming up and saying, okay, hey, this is my logo or I had something similar to this. Uh, that kind of, you guys ever hear about trademark infringement? <laughs> Alright, so this process helps you not ever have trademark infringement. Um, so we started that process, got our logo trademark. Then we had to get our employee identification number. Um, that is essentially your social security number for your businesses. You can get your business a, a legal identity. And once we did, and everybody gets one free one. Um, and then after that, I think it cost like $85 for you to get one. So after we did that, we went and got our, our company um, bank account. And it's very important, which we learned this um, after our second year, um, on the points of having somebody who knows what they're doing with taxes and can give you great advice because you never want to mix your personal money up with your, your company's money. Because once the tax season comes around, and when you're, when you're a small company, it might not necessarily matter. But once you start getting big, you know, you don't ever want to have the IRS on your back. I heard it's not a good feeling. We haven't experienced it yet. I hope you never do. But you want to make sure that you keep your books in order. Um, QuickBooks. Are you guys familiar with QuickBooks? Very, very good tool to use. We learned that along the way as well. Um, so after doing all this, now we were able to say, okay, you know what? We're official entrepreneurs. We were official uh, business owners. Wow, what a great accomplishment. Um, and to some, to some respect, you know, I think it a lot of it has to do with our age and us not ever having that support or having a point of reference to fall back on and say, okay, you know, how, how does this process look? We came out with our first collection uh, in June, June 2010, right after I graduated college. And us being arrogant or rookies in the business, we thought that as soon as we released this product on our online store, because we knew so many people on Facebook and Twitter, that we were just going to sell out. Well, at least they came, nothing sold. Second day came, nothing sold. Like, I think like a week or two weeks passed, and nothing was getting sold, and we were just like, what is going on here? So now, we have to take a step back um, and realize, okay, you know, we need to be a little bit more aggressive. We need to figure out some other ways to penetrate the market. Now, going back to the research that I said that I did for that, for that two-year time span, um, one of the things that a lot of companies were doing in New York and LA were these things called pop-up shops. Are you guys familiar with what a pop-up shop is? Great, something you guys don't know that I can teach you. So what a pop-up shop is, it's pretty much a, a company goes into, or a clothing line goes into a store, and they pretty much take over that store for that day. They decorate it however they want to with their merchandise and promotional material, and then they promote an event for that evening for consumers and buyers to come out and take a look at the new line of product. Um, the great thing about this, it gives people the opportunity to, to mingle with the people who are actually creating these designs that you know, I'm hoping that these people are fans of. And um, it gives you an opportunity to, to, to get rid of this inventory you have. So that's one of the things that we started to do around our second, our second season, which was, was uh, winter of 2011. And we had a great turnout. You know, it made it made it got a lot of the press coverage. It um, actually allowed us to get on a couple of different uh, artists. Um, you guys know who Wale is? No. Yes. Okay. So Wale is a is a, a pretty big rapper. We were able to get our clothes on him as well as a couple other um, um, quote unquote high profile people in Atlanta. So and all yes. So you did that in Atlanta? Yeah, we did it. We did it in downtown. Um, and one of the reasons why we did it downtown and not necessarily like in our home area is so we knew where our consumers were at. So you always want to make sure that you're in that area where your target market is. Um, but yeah, so we did we did this pop-up shop and it just started, it really kicked off our buzz and from there, you know, we, yes, oh, question.
themselves. Um, and that's kind of it was kind of that was kind of a bittersweet because one thing that we realized when, after the fact, a company looks so much better when they're represented by somebody else. You know, if I come to you and I say, hey, you know, this is my company, you should, you know, do a write up on us or whatever the case may be. You know, it looks it looks completely different. You know, so hindsight at this point, you know, we look back and said, okay, we need to have somebody to handle our public relations. Um, now, on the flip side of that, with us never having somebody who has done public relations before, we have some learning curves. We didn't necessarily know what to look for in a person who handles public relations because you got to say, like, everybody at the end of the day, everybody's trying to get paid, and everybody will do or say whatever it is they need, they want to to take advantage of you. So. Not saying that this particular person took advantage of us, but they definitely probably hyped themselves up to have a little bit more connections than you know what it is that they actually had. And you know, the thing about it is when when you start your business, and I've heard this from people who are very, very seasoned in the entrepreneurial field, you're always going to have you're always going to take some L's. You're always going to you know have, make mistakes, but it's, I think it's all perspective. I think it's. Not necessarily having a, making a failure, having a failure that took place, but having a learning lesson, and that's <coughs> the perspective that we try to keep things in. Because failure essentially means that you know we give it up and we didn't continue to try to push forward. You know, learning curve. You know, uh, that pretty much means that okay, you know, we took a look at this and this didn't work, but we're gonna try to go somewhere else. Perfect example of this was this morning, and this happens in businesses all the time. Um, woke up this morning, I had this perfect plan, right? I'm gonna get up, I have to go pick up um, some product, and then I'm gonna pick up my cameraman, and then after that, I'm gonna come here, and I probably have like a cool 30, 45 minutes to spare. Sounds like a great plan, right? Well, do you guys know where McDonald's Georgia is? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I didn't know where that was at, and I didn't realize how far that was from civilization. <laughs> I got to I got to McDonald's, my GPS messes up, it sends me in a completely wrong different direction and ends up wasting about 20 or 30 minutes. So there goes my my, my little breathing room right there. So then I'm saying, okay, um, I gotta get back to the to East Atlanta to get my camera to get back here as soon as possible. So I'm speeding. And sorry, I'm sorry, Mom. Um, everybody has my mother back there, so this is the first time I've heard it here, so I didn't tell you. <laughs> so, I'm coming out 75, and I'm like, okay, great, you know, 80, I'm in a 55, nobody's going to see me, I've been on this road plenty of times, I'll be okay. No, I wasn't okay, I wasn't okay. I passed one set of cops, thinking, okay, they didn't stop me, I'm still good to go. Um, I get on 285, there's never cops on 285, at least, you know, that's tagging you. So, I end up getting pulled over at doing 80 in a 55 lane. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, so now, I had this 30, 45 minute gap that obviously got cut down, and now I'm like, almost like negative 15, 20 minutes. And it's like, all right, so this plan didn't work out too well. You know, but I had a choice. I could, I could have called and said, well listen, you know, I have to reschedule, but can't come in today for whatever reason, because I have my own personal issues. Or I can say, you know what, you know, I'm going to be a little bit more careful. You know, I learned from my mistake when I got pulled over on 285, and I'm going to keep on pushing. And that's pretty much what I did, just keep on pushing. Now, um, one of the things that I want to kind of touch on is the what it looks like to be an entrepreneur, like what that process looks like outside of doing the, the legal work, what, it, what, it, what that day-to-day -day looks like. So. What kind of, are, are, are you guys traditional or non-traditional students? Non-traditional non students? Okay, so for my non-traditional students, or traditional, you guys can, you know, tech, you know, I on this. What is your guys' daily food diet look like? Pizza. Pizza. My love pizza. Pizza. Fruit. Fruit. Y'all living out, y'all living life. Fish. Fish. Chicken. Fish. Chicken and fish? Well, I did find some uh, like 10 pounds of tilapia at a farmer's market for $25, so I guess that could work. Um, so for us, this is what it pretty much looked like. It was the more typical college diet, which was a lot of Roman noodles, um, a lot of 
um, cereal. cereal. <laughs> a lot of cereal. A lot of spaghetti because you know you guys can make the spaghetti stretch for a very long time if you if need be. And a lot of water. And um, that's your, I know you, I'm not sure this is a dry campus or not, but if you guys do drink, um, all the good stuff goes out the window. Say hello, say goodbye to Grey Goose and Belvedere, and say hello to your 40 ounces of Miller High Life and High Hands. Um, they're very, very cheap. And the reason why, just even on the food, on, on a diet basis, you people spend so much money eating out. All that's money that you could be using towards paying for product, or paying for marketing, or paying for promotional materials, or just paying for gas to get from one meeting to the next meeting. Every dollar counts. So you have to be very, very, very mindful of that, uh, which going into it, luckily, we were. Um, any of you guys have relationships? Yeah. Yeah, OK. I'm not. And one of the reasons why I'm not <laughs> and I can't be is because when you start your own your, your, your business for the first time, your time is pretty much you know sold up. You, there, it really is no social life. Um, only reason why I go out occasionally is because for networking purposes. But that's also because that's where my business has lies in. You know, so there isn't, you know, oh, I'm about to go take this vacation trip to, to New York with the rest of my friends or a spring break in Miami or West Palm Beach. All that stuff is pretty much tossed out the window. Again, why? Because of money that you have to put towards your actual business. Um, and then also, you know, again, with the relationships, relationships cost money. Your friend wants to go out to eat. Um, if you're a, a female, you know, you might get off the hook in this case, but for us, you guys spend a lot of money to maintain that relationship. I don't have that money to spend on anybody else to settle my company and make sure that my company is flourishing. Um, and truth be told, nobody wants to be with anybody that's not successful. You know, nobody wants to be with a bum or somebody who is going from um, idea to idea to idea. So for me and my partner, while we have our youth on our side, you know, why not make the sacrifice now on on the food that we eat, on our relationships, um, on the sleep, because you're definitely not getting any sleep if you're doing it the right way. Um, your weekends really aren't your weekends because you should be out there on your downtime, you know, furthering your business. For me, when I graduated from college, there wasn't any honorable group startup plan. So both of me and my partner, we had to work. So I was working at Wells Fargo for about a year, a year and a half after after graduation. Um, and again, just like ESPN Radio, I hated that job, but I knew it was necessary to take all the money that I was making from from Wells Fargo and put it towards my company. And sometimes you have to make those sacrifices. Um, being an entrepreneur, you have to make a lot of decisions that a lot of people don't want to make because they're just not the favorable ones. And after working for about a year and a half there, um, in October of 2000, excuse me, October 2011, I decided to quit my job and do it full time. Now, at that point, even after we started to buzz about the company, you know, growing and you know, sales were coming down on a relatively consistent basis, um, there still wasn't just a surplus of uh, security net cash for me to sit on just in case something happened. So it was really a step on faith. My personal opinion, when you say you want to be an entrepreneur, that's pretty much you saying that God, I'm trusting you to do, uh, to, to show up in ways that I've never seen before because there's so many X factors that you're gonna, that you're gonna encounter that under normal circumstances, or actually period, you're not gonna know that it even exists. Um, and it tries your patience, it tries your uh, belief in yourself sometimes and in your company. I mean, I can't begin to, to relate how many times I have to ask myself, okay, am I making the right decision? You know, am I moving in the right direction? And, you know, after asking those questions, something will happen. It's like, okay, you know, we got to win there, so obviously I'm moving in the right direction. Um, but yes, so is any of this making sense to anybody so far? All right, so I'm just kind of curious. Like, what is it that you guys want to do with your life? What is it that you guys are in school for? Like, what is it, what's the overall goal?
50,000, give or take. I would be happy. I would be happy with that too coming out of college. Um, so, just to kind of give you guys a little snapshot of that, what that looks like coming out of college. Um, and I won't even take myself, because I just went and got my undergraduate degree, which in these days really isn't nothing. There's nothing special about a completed four years. It barely even gets you into the playing field. Um, I had a friend of mine that I went to college with, and you know, super smart girl. She got all A's, top of her class, all that jazz. Ends up going to get her MBA in this program that had her studying in London and then in Dubai. So I mean, and, and, and her degree was in international business. That was the, like that was the concentration, and so she's pretty hot stuff. Yeah, she definitely came back home and couldn't find a job. She definitely came back home, and once she did find a job, might have been making twenty thousand. You know, I think it's very. Sometimes it, while we're in college, we get this dream sold to us that, you know, if you go to school and you work hard and you get out into the real world, it's going to pay off. Anybody who tells you that, they're lying to you. That is not the case. Which it, I hope I'm not calling any of you guys liars. <laughs> Yes, and actually it kind of came up once again, like for me, 
I pay attention to what's going on in me, uh, not only in my culture, but also in the world as well. And a lot of that does play into my influence on how I design. Um, coincidentally, though, we started to be, this process that I'm designing right now for football, although I didn't go into thinking about politics, it actually does have a very political uh, and social driven identity, I guess. So it kind of worked out that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to add, you just do your, um, your company through the computer or like you put it in stores too? Good question. It's something I forgot to touch on. So, um, most people think that, well, first of all, we started off with our online store. That was the first thing we started off with because we wanted to give the people a point of reference to come <laughs> and not only see the product but also potentially buy it. Um, we, going into this, we thought that, all right, we could get into some stores, a couple of boutiques, and you know we're gonna get paid, and it's gonna be a great situation. I can quit my job. All right, that definitely didn't happen. Part of the reason why that didn't happen is just the politics in my particular industry. Um, I mean, these these guys have egos the size of China. It's insane. And for us, I'm I have no problem with working hard, but I'm I do very very bad at pissing off the people, which is another reason why I was definitely stuck in corporate America. Um, and we pretty much took the approach. We got into a couple stores, and initially it was it was okay because we were able to get some product some product off. Uh, yeah, we were able to get some product off. Um, but when we started taking a look at the numbers from the financial side, typically when you're a new brand, you go into a store, they're going to give you on a on a great case scenario a 70 to 30 percent split, which means that um, you take 70 percent, they take 30 percent. Typically, when new brands, you'll end up getting a 50-50 split, right? So, say if, and this was the case with us, we were, once we started getting these accounts, we were getting these 50-50 splits. Well, the problem was, these stores weren't promoting us properly. You know, because the whole purpose of also getting into a store is to be able to reach an uh, audience that you haven't been able to reach yet. So, that wasn't happening. On top of that, they were taking a product that we might have been selling for $30 or $35 and almost charging $55, $60 for it. So now, it looks very bad on us because a regular consumer isn't thinking, all right, there's this two to 300% market. What they're thinking is like, yo, I'm just paying $60 and it's because of these guys in our own You know, so for us, it it just didn't make sense. And then we were going out doing our own events, <laughs> um, such as the pop-up shops, such lecture series like this, and we were making a great deal of money. So the way I was looking at it, Okay, I'm giving you guys 20 pieces, you know, and I might have made $400 off of those 20 pieces selling to you, but I really lost 800 because that's what I could have been making if I was taking all the profit at myself. You know, you want to, it's all a number of standards, it's never anything personal. So what we ended up doing was on all our accounts. You guys don't want to promote us, you guys don't want to give us a better deal, perfectly fine. We're already making money on our own, going directly to the consumer. Now, that's where um, the idea of a lecture series store kind of came into play, which is similar to, to this situation right here. What we did was we reached out to about eight different colleges and we said, hey, listen, you know, let us come to your school um, and promote and talk about, give a lecture on entrepreneurship, marketing, the importance of efficient branding, um, and then allow us to sell our product afterwards. And that's what we did. I mean, a great idea. Yes. What's your primary market demographic? Is it just college and universities, or do you go into elementary and parents of students as well? Um, it's not necessarily college. The age demographic that we serve is going to be between, uh, between 15 and 28. Uh, now, of course, you have some that bleed a little bit into the, the younger teens and a little bit older. But those are the primary people that are really concerned about how it is that they look. They have more disposable income because they didn't spend their parents' money or their college and they get the refund checks and then they can you know, spend money that way on college jobs. So uh, now what we are doing is going and we are actually going to to a high school next week um, about these exact same things. Because uh, our biggest thing is we're very much on purpose driven. You know, our product is a very product at times are great and dope. So they're gonna it's gonna sell on its own. But we're very, what's important to us is being able to go out there and be a point of reference to people who don't have a point of reference of what it looks like to be a young entrepreneur fresh out of college. Show people that this is what, this
this is very attainable because for us, when we were growing up, the closest thing that we saw to somebody being extremely successful was the guys that we saw on TV or the guys that we saw in there because across the street from us and we don't want to go that route. So.
I wouldn't change anything. Um, because even the even the mistakes that we made, even the money that we lost because of the mistakes we made, all that stuff is is gearing us to Alright, so we just gonna wrap it up here at Life University. Um, where Cassie just came through, gave an excellent presentation about entrepreneurship, you know, pursuing excellence and everything that embodies this honorable coding group uh, mantra. And so um, salute to Life University. Appreciate you for having us come out. Start our step and sign off. Yeah.